Chris, you we've been talking about doing an interview for a long time. Yeah. And uh, probably less than 60 days ago, you called me and you said, we need to do this. Yeah. Yep. And on the other end of that line, I'm listening to you express why you need to do this. And in all seriousness, there's some there's some mortality motivation on yeah. why we're oh, yeah. having this yeah. talk. Yeah. There is because um, because of my health history that you and I have talked about, and we know what I've been through. Um, you know, here I am at 57 years old, and I was told most of my life I wouldn't make it to 10. Yeah. So it's something to think about. And I've st I've went through some more health pro problems recently, and uh, I felt a little bit more urgency to not only talk about my story about where I how I got to where I'm at and stuff, but more importantly, to try to inspire others. Mm -hmm. You and I talk about that all the time, that in this life, I think that's something that I got, as I got older and I began to teach photography, that it really came down to, it wasn't to try to make a living. You and I talk about that all the time, when you focus on money, you make less money, right? Yeah. And what it really came down to is I realized right away as I started to teach that I had a lot to share with others and that passion to help others mm -hmm. really grew. and. But I never got it out to a, a large enough audience. I, I wanted to reach everybody I could. Yeah. Everybody I could. And this is a way I can do that. Maybe record some of this so in the future people can see it. Yeah. What's well, behind the emotion? Um, life is short. It's... um. You know, the thing is, Art, when you go through health things like I've gone through for such a long period of time, you really, well, you know, we just joked about my license plate, one life live it. You know, when you go through a lot of health problems and you really suffer through those and you realize that you faced mortality a lot of times, right? You and I talked about that when I was a kid. I mean, I went through many times where I was going to commit suicide at eight, nine, ten years old, which what is an eight, nine, ten year old thinking about yeah. that for, right? And the mortality of it and boy, that, that license plate says one life live it. Um, it brings home, it really does when you're that sick, it brings home how valuable this time is here. That's why. I mean it comes back to like you and I talked about, is that like I tell people, if I take a photo with this and then I go home and sit in front of a computer for several hours, think about how much of that life you've taken away that's so short. And it might only be two or three hours, but that two or three hours when you're sitting in front of that computer at home, you're not with your family, you're not with your spouse, you're not out in nature. So what are you doing? Why are you taking that photo? Because that's not why we got into this. It's our passion for life. It's our passion for nature or passion for people if you're a portrait photographer, whatever it may be. And then now we've turned it into this sitting in front of a computer. So my emotion comes from just wanting people to really live life to their fullest and realize that not every day, but it's every hour that matters, every hour. And that's, it's important. So let's rewind the tape. I've heard little snippets of the struggles and the history that you've had, but take us back yeah. to Chris as a toddler. Okay. And walk us up to today. Okay, well, I'll try to make it as brief as I can, but you know, okay. So we're going to start from when I was born. So I was born not breathing, right? <clears throat> so they fixed that little problem, obviously. I'm still sitting here. But as soon as they do that, they realize I'm born with two dislocated hips. So right when I was born, they waited about six months, I think. But then they put me in a half body cast from here up to here. And I wore that for the first three years of my life. So what was funny is how I learned to get around is dragging myself on my elbows, not walking, right? So at three years old, I get this cast off. They start teaching me how to walk, and they find I have severe kidney and bladder problems. So we go have a surgery in Boise, and in that surgery, um, the doctor that did it didn't do it correctly, which caused scar tissue, which caused damage, which caused infections. Now, this is where we're going to fast forward a little bit. So from the age of three to 11, I averaged over 100 up to 150 days a year in the hospital every single year mm -hmm. during that time. Uh, over somewhere in the, our best guess is it's over 50 surgeries, but we're not sure how many, right? So we went through that, and there's a whole backstory of when I went through the school and all those kind of things. But health-wise, 
So I went through all that, and in 1980, my mom found a guy. Uh, again, we, we, we talk about divine inspiration and things like that, right? So my mom, we're sitting in Boise. They're about ready to put a permanent urinary bag on me that would never be reversible, right? And uh, my mom sees this article in the Boise newspaper, and it says this kid named, I'll never forget his name, I think it was Donnie, and I think the last name was Prisco or Donnie, I can't remember my last name, but a little kid named Donnie, and says, here's this whole article about, hey, this kid went over to Boston, Massachusetts, had a doctor do a surgery for the first time ever. And my mom saw it and thought, well, that's exactly what my son goes through. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's the chance of seeing a newspaper article, we're living in Boise, this kid lives in Meridian, 20 miles away. And my mom contacted that lady, called the hospital in Seattle, said, you're not putting a bag on my kid. And said, we're gonna try to do this. So, that was a life-changing moment because it allowed this. Because think about that. If I would've had that bag, that would've limited everything I do, everything I do. And so blessed and so grateful to not have that. But she contacted this guy, took six months, and he made an appointment. And I love telling this story. So I show up in Boston, Mass General Hospital, this gigantic hospital. We're there for three days and not even a nurse had talked to us. Mm -hmm. And this little anesthesia guy comes in, and my dad was pretty tall. This anesthesia comes in and says, I'm prepping my son, your son, for a surgery tomorrow morning. And the, my dad turns around and says, nobody's touching my kid until we see a doctor. This is like a seven o'clock at night. 9.30, almost 10 o'clock that night, we get a call to go to the doctor's office. We walk up, and here's this doctor looking at these charts of me. My mom sits down. I hope all the story's not too long. This is great. My mom sits down. My dad sits down. He doesn't even turn around. Pretty soon, he just turns around. He goes, I allow 24 hours to your son. That starts tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., not tonight, and I don't have time for these inconveniences. And the two other doctors stand there, turn around, which ended up being both his sons. They turned around and said, they just kind of looked at us. And then, I'll never forget this, Dr. Hen looked over and looked at my mom's purse and went, hmm. Stood up, walked over, grabbed a pack of cigarettes out of her, her uh, purse, crushed them, threw them in the garbage and said, I don't allow smoking in my hospital. And this is clear back in 1980 where you could smoke anywhere you wanted. Yeah. So it was pretty remarkable. Um, but that guy saved my life. I mean, he did a 19-hour surgery on me all by himself. Um, obviously anesthesia stuff there, but he did the surgery, did a total reconstruction of the tract and turned my life completely around. Since then, I've had to still have kidney and bladder problems. I still have kidney infections, but I'm not in the hospital and I'm not having constant surgeries. But, but after that though, Art, I, I went through heavy drug addiction during part of that time, obviously because trying to escape all that pain, right? So I went through that. So that's part of my health history. I really look at that because that really stunted a lot of things I could have been doing back then, right? But then I went from that directly into, uh, I had a spinal fusion on one of my spine. I've had four since then. So I've had four back surgeries with actual fusions. I've had cancer. The cancer near could have really killed me. One of the things I talk about quite often with cancer is that you and I talked about this earlier. Everything I do in my life is driven. And what I mean by that is that, and I live with intent, and I did that during my cancer, thank goodness. When I got cancer, I had a sister die of cancer. So for me to get it was pretty scary, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a serious cancer. But I'll never forget that. And that's when Katie came into my life, right? And so <laughs> I'll never forget this. I, I'm sitting there at this doctor's office. And he's like, well, we're going to put a feeding tube in. You're going to have to take some time off from work. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not going to take any days off. And I'll never forget that. That guy looked at me and said, no, you're not going to have a choice. You're gonna feel so bad, you're not gonna to go to work. And I said, you don't know me very well. So <laughs> I go back and I tell Katie, here's my new employee, which don't, you know, that whole thing about never <laughs> dating your employees didn't work out so well. <laughs> so, you know, it was one of those things where she, I went back and I told her that. She goes, no, it's okay if you take some time off, you know, all the way through all that treatment, I never took a day off. Mm. And it was great because people would come in the door. Well, you know me, I'm kind of bold about stuff, but. People would come in the door and I'd be talking to a customer and I'd just grab that big saran, stick it in my tube and start feeding it myself. And people look at me like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and Katie come over, what are you doing? I'm like, I I'm eating lunch, yeah. you know? <laughs> that's it, <laughs> pushing this food in. And that's, that I lived that through that whole thing. But since then, the mortality thing comes in, Art, is that 
you know, I'm still having some kidney and, and bladder issues. I know they're starting to fail. I know I'm going through several other issues. And in fact, I'm going to the Mayo Clinic in just a week or two. And so, you know, I felt the urgency to really talk about all this now and share it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's good. It's a good thing. So let's keep rewinding. Um, okay. Four or five years old. Yeah. You've, where are you at in your life? Oh, That's... oh, bad, bad, bad. Um, this is this is a tough one, Art. Um, but I've I'll, I also have to when I feel this emotion, I need to back up for a minute and go. You know how blessed I am, and how lucky I am to be alive. So back then, school was very different than it is now, right? So I, I always tell people it was really tough on a on a young kid like me. I had no bladder control, and here I'm in a public school, right? Well, as you can imagine, wet pants at four or five year old is not good, mm -hmm. right? So the teasing was terrible. But what happened? And this is, this is the part where I really inspire people to, we're so blessed now to have the protection that we have. And what I mean by that is now people are aware of what's going on in schools and they do their best to protect kids. So back then I, I had a teacher in, I think it was in third grade, that came to me one day and um, didn't even tell my mom or anything. And she came and told me and she goes, you know, I'm sorry, but you're really distracting to the rest of the class. So she stuck me in a closet mm. and I was in that closet um, probably two years, maybe three. Um, and it was weird because I never told mom they would put me in there and she would give me my homework, and everything else. Right. And during breaks, I would go out. It, it was everything. And the class door wasn't shut or anything, but she would take me out of that classroom. So I wasn't disruptive to class and not disruptive in a bad way of being like um, disruptive actually, you know, emotionally or, or physically or noise or anything else, just from the kids teasing me, they, they want to take that out. So now, you know, that would never be ever be tolerated now. Thank goodness. And back then, though, it was not really looked down upon. Mm -hmm. It was really different. And that's not that long ago when you think about it. Right. You know, that was back in the 1970s. And um, so, yeah, mentally really tough on a on a five six year old obviously right but that but at the same time like i said i get emotional about it because the pain that's there but i'll tell you though it made me who i am now yeah that that all those experiences and i really try to teach people that all that pain we go through if you can look past that pain even when you're going through it you know i always look at it as like a book when you turn the page of a book you're on a new day well mm -hmm. it's the same thing I just kept turning those pages and I just kept going. But I went through times as a kid of, of really, really contemplating and trying suicide. Luckily, as a kid, you're not smart enough to know how to really do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was lucky, but, but I had family structure around me that helped me a lot. Uh, that was when my grandfather stepped in. Yeah. Well, what about your grandfather? It was really fascinating. My grandfather was always part of our life, and so was my grandma. They lived in Jerome, Idaho. We lived over in Boise. So we were fairly close, right? And they would help quite often when we'd go to the hospital and things like that. But one of the things my grandfather noticed when I was, and I was nine years old, so that was 1975, he brought me a brownie camera, and I'll show that to you later. He brought me a brownie camera, and he gave it to me. It was really funny. He gave me two rolls of film. And... I don't remember a lot from my childhood, but I remember him saying something to me about in the effect that he said, you have two rolls of film. You got 48 pictures. Don't waste them. Mm. And I, you know, tell that to a nine-year-old. You guys know how it is. Now you got a cell phone. You're like, <laughs> click, 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 you know, like crazy. And he told me, hey, be careful and don't shoot it fast. Well, what I do, I went out and shot it fast. Like just a random junk. It was horrible. I didn't know, have any idea how to control that camera. And he didn't really give me any advice at first. Didn't really teach me at first. He just said, just go shoot. And it was really funny because I get the film done. And I'm like, now what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. He says, you have to get it developed. I said, well, how do I get it developed? Well, you pay to get it developed. And so I went and talked to my mom. And my mom said, sure, you do chores. And you do this many chores. And we'll develop your film. OK. So I did the chores. Got it done. Well, I wanted more film. Mom had an easy answer for that do these chores and we'll give you more film. Well, when you learn that way, you know, we tease about me not editing and stuff. When you learn that way at nine years old that every roll of film you want costs you time. 
mm-hmm. that you don't want to give, right? Every time you want that film developed, it costs you time. And when you get 24 pictures on a roll of film and you get it developed and they're all totally bad and they're all black or they're all white and you're a kid and you go, wow, but I had to do these chores to get that. It makes you really quickly slow down. It really quickly makes you learn how to control that camera. Mm-hmm. And I'm still that way to this day. Mm-hmm. I have not changed that. I still, well, as you know, I dive into this probably deeper than most people, mm-hmm. much more, even professionals, just because, and I, I tell people it's not a negative thing, but when you don't edit and you're not willing to edit in any way other than cropping and that's it, you do change the way you shoot and you do change the way you think very quickly, mm. right? Yeah. You do. So. Yeah, so that that history of my grandfather helping me get that camera, the whole point of that camera was um, to help me escape the pain I was experiencing with my sickness. And it did, because he knew how much I loved nature and he knew how much I loved fishing. So he's like, here, I'll put something in your hands that can take you away from all that. And it did. It did a great job of it. So your grandpa gives you a camera. Yep. Gives you a distraction from the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you go next? After that, really, that was, it was great. And I, again, I've shot ever since, right? That never really left my life. But I really, because of that pain and everything else, I think I just got really, well, I don't think, I got really distracted and really scattered. And what I mean by that is when you're going through that kind of pain, you're, you're trying to find any avenue you can to get away from that pain, right? And so that, Partially, when I hit about 11 or 12, you know, I discovered here, this is the 1970s, you know, my sister and brother smoking pot. Well, they're like, here, try some of that. And the very first time, I, I truly believe that you're an addict before you ever touch drugs or alcohol. It's, it's in your DNA. I think it's just, it's just the way it is. And boy, the first time was like, wow, I could escape the world. I can escape the world. And instantly, overnight, drug addict. I mean, full on bow everywhere I could find it, I'm going to go get it. And that lasted a long time. And, you know, it was not It was obviously not bad when you're 11 or 12. It's pretty hard to get drugs. So it's, you know, it's always trying to talk my sister or brother and let me have some or something. And, and uh, so it went from that to, you know, all the way into my 20s. And then, thank goodness, at, at about 22 years old, my parents did an intervention on me, and I went to a treatment center. And thank goodness they did that because I probably wouldn't have survived another year. It got pretty bad. And so, sorry guys. Um, You know, you and I are both spiritual people. And I do believe that's when God stepped in and he said it's time. And I got sober. What I'm trying to think is how many years it is now. You know, everybody keeps really good track of it. Most people get in sobriety, keep day by day almost. And I did that for a long time, but I think I'm approaching, well, what, 35 years Mm -hmm. of sobriety. And that sobriety has everything. Alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, everything. Um, 35 years now. So really blessed to be that. And I use that experience now to try to help others as much as I can. And also to go back to what you ask is what happening progressed from there I can tell you one thing that photography all the way through that was in the background and it was always that um, how can I put it not not just the escape but it was a way to refocus my life and refocus what was important and I would always go back to shooting that and then after that you know I went to college I decided I was going to be a counselor I went into political science and biology and did all these different things, jumping around. And you know what's funny is I went through, and Art, you and I have talked about this a little bit. I went through, uh, gosh, I was a, a car salesman for a while. I was a professional driver for Chrysler stuff for a while. I was a fishing guide, a whitewater guide, a hunting guide. Um, now, if you're trying to, if you're paying attention to that, a lot of this is outdoors, right? Mm-hmm. Fishing, hunting, backpacking guide. Uh, I worked in the park for here a little while. And uh, in fact, we, we had a great experience. I always love to share with people. I'm, I'm one of the very few few people, along with two friends of mine, 
that actually walked the full circumference of Yellowstone Lake. That's 143 miles of, of shoreline. Uh, absolutely wonderful experience. But you know, even during that time, camera with me the whole time. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of us that grew up with photography, it was always there. What happened to me is one day I thought, well, gosh, it's always there. I'm always shooting. I've always loved it. Why not try to do it as a living? And that's what I did. And that's how that change happened is that, you know, I was really lucky. I found a job at a camera store of all things. That camera store allowed me to start reaching people. And then I thought, well, gosh, I know this inside out like crazy when I teach people. And I thought to myself, and, and it's funny, if you asked friends that knew me back then, they'd say, really? You stood in front of people and taught them? Really, you? Like, terrified of, you know, standing in front of people? And right away, I took to it. The very first class, I can remember, not feeling nervous. I was just like, I know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I built those classes up, and when I left there, I wanted to keep pursuing it, so I opened my own store. So, yeah. I don't know if you know this or not, but... 25 years ago was the first time I saw you. I didn't meet you, but I saw really? you. And I remember clearly, not sure why I remember this, but yeah. you had a camera in your hand. <laughs> yeah. You were behind yeah. the counter at yeah. Forest Jewelry. Yeah, yeah. And That's right. yep. there wasn't any customers that were buying from you. I think there were a couple of other employees behind the counter, but you had a camera in your hand. Yeah. You got a camera sitting here today. <laughs> yeah. This camera, yeah. just from what you've shared, represents way more than just the camera oh it is and i wish i wish truly that it 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 did to more people and you and i've talked about that again that um the seeking approval online the seeking the approval on facebook um having that be so important to people to me that's that's the last thing that's important it's this is a tool if you want to look at it this way this is a tool that gets me into nature it not only as a nature photographer, right? But not only that, but it gets me into really paying attention to life because for me, I'm capturing those moments and I don't edit them. So I'm waiting for that right light. I'm waiting for the right situation. Sometimes I'll go back to things over and over again for years on end. Well, this is a tool to get me here. And it's a tool to produce images that, like I said, if I get likes and loves on Facebook, great right everybody likes that approval but what really matters is i looked at this way art that i have pictures that i've sold to people that will hang in their houses for a very long time and i have people that i've sold pictures a long time ago that they hang in their house and it brings them joy every day and then but more importantly than all of that i want this is what i really want people to know is this is a tool that has now created you know my bear picture right yeah the bear picture i'm so well known for i always express to people this the beautiful thing about photography and this becomes part of your life every day. You're documenting your life every day and you're freezing real moments in time and we're doing it in a way that our parents never could, right? So we're getting better photos. But think about this. Every morning, I walk by that bear picture. It's, it's, it's where it's at. You know you've been in my house. When you come out of the bedroom, you're walking in the hall. It's right there in the hallway, right? Every morning, I see that picture. Every single morning. Every single morning, I can remember the smell of that air when I took that picture. It was up in Alaska, and we were shooting coastal bears. I can remember the sensation of that bear charging straight at me. I'm down in the water. I can remember watching her cub on the left-hand side. I can feel the temperature. I can do all those things. I can re-experience that moment in time every single day, and sometimes multiple times a day, right? There's no other art that you can buy None, anywhere, that's going to give you that experience. Yeah. There's nothing. So for me, that's what I inspire people to do. Is I want them to not only use this as a tool and document their lives all the time and quit doing it with a cell phone. I know that sounds crazy. Do it with a real camera because you can print them big and you can do things with this that you can't do with a cell phone. Really master that camera. But then here's the important part. Don't just post that picture online. Print it. You know, DJ and you and I have all talked about this. The art of printing's been lost. We now take the picture, beautiful photo, we share it a couple of times, we stick it on a hard drive, it's never seen again. No, 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 no. Fill your house with your art, not somebody else's. Because those art is your memories. Those memories will stir emotions every day that no other art in the world can do. None. And it's not, I'm not just talking pictures of your family. I'm talking about pictures of, of wildlife and nature and experiences and places you've been and document it the best way you can. So, But print it. 
the yep. lost of print. I, to me, that's the biggest thing we all need to do now is print our photos so we have those memories hanging in front of us all yeah. the time. Yeah. You've talked about it's giving important. it away as well. Yeah. So I do. I, you know, my wife told me one time, Katie said something that really sunk home with me. She said, because I kept telling her about not wanting to edit and things like that and that I don't edit. And she said, she said, well, isn't it funny? She goes, we need to be using our photography to connect to others, not disconnect. Mm. Right. And how we can do that is not only sharing them online, that's fine. That's always a good thing to do, right? But give that away and give your photos away. So quite often I've given the photos to be prints, expensive prints, to people that I just knew. Mm -hmm. I just knew they needed that in their lives. And so I give it away and I give pictures away a lot. Um, not just big prints and things like that, but little prints. Like, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things we do in the store, a lot of people don't know in our store up here, we have a bunch of wallet sized photos of some of my photos. And I buy hundreds of them a year. And we give away hundreds, if not thousands of them a year to kids. Mm -hmm. And we're like, here, here's a picture that I took. Isn't that awesome? You really ought to try photography. And try to inspire them. I don't care if they're three or they're nine. We're like, yeah, isn't this cool? And they, they get to take a photo home. And yeah. that's sharing as well, right? But sharing the knowledge of the one things, if you want to go to that route is what I think you're asking as well, is, is, is giving that back. I truly believe that if you know how to shoot pictures, it is your responsibility to go teach others. And you might say, well, I'm not really a teacher. Yeah, you are. I'm uncomfortable about it. Get over it. Yeah. You have a responsibility because this is an art form that anyone can do. Anyone can, I believe that. I think anyone can be a world-class photographer. It's not rocket science and people try to make it that. But boy, if you can do that and then if you can inspire others, because think about this, you guys. What if you give a camera that you don't use anymore to a kid that's sick? And it does what it did for me. It's crazy. Without that, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, Art. Right. I would have ended my life. And I have absolutely no doubt at all that I would have so you know you think about these things that's a lot more than taking a photograph yeah a lot more and in this day and age with people suffering like they are and you know you and I you just brought that up a little while ago about the urgency of me wanting to share this message this can really turn someone's life around yeah. and it can take them away from all the living on a social media thing and all the pressure of school and all the pressure of life. This is really an escape and it's a healthy escape, especially as a nature photographer. I've always looked that way is that, you know, think about this, you guys, we talk about my physical fitness. We talk about all these different things I do. Well, this keeps me healthy because it keeps me out walking. It keeps me out in the wilderness. It keeps me moving. It keeps me experiencing life in new ways. It keeps teaching me uh, how to capture things in reality. And not only that, but you know, the neat thing is, Art, and you and I have talked about this a little bit too. The one of the things I'm really fortunate about this is that I've turned it into a living, right? So by turning this into a living, I now get to experience that every day in a way that most people don't get to, because it's, it's a part of my life and it always has been, but now it, it literally is part of my life all the time, every day, every single day, every single hour. Mm -hmm. And I get to experience that. And you know, the cool part is I get to see people walk into my store numerous times a day. And we always tease about that, but we get to save someone's vacation every single day. But it's much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. We get to save people in lots of other ways and inspire others. And so by giving away that teaching, giving away cameras, giving away pictures, giving all that, that information and all that knowledge away really helps people, yeah. helps other people's lives improve a lot. One thing I really believe deeply in is that career can be a way of being and not just a way of life. It is. Yeah. And, and you and I, you know me enough to know this, that, you know, um, the money has never mattered to me mm -hmm. in the business. I mean, I own three businesses. And that's all fine and dandy, but uh, my focus truly is, truly is just to help others learn this. And 
And as you know, uh, one of my big passions too is to get people off their computers, get them off those computers. You know, so many people have been taught that they can't do photography without editing. And you've seen my photos, you've seen my raw files, you've seen what I do, you can. Mm -hmm. And if you love to edit, great. Uh, that's fine and dandy, but just remember what the cost is.